Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're recording the session, as Zoom has let you know. Uh, we have enabled the live transcript for closed captioning, and you may find that option on the control bar that usually appears at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're extending the warmest welcome to the final ASLI Spotlight 2022 on the topic of nature and memory. My name is Suzanne Roberts, and I'm so happy to be able to participate in today's event. I'm Zooming today from South Lake Tahoe, California, which is home of the Washoe people. For those of you joining an ASLI event for the first time, welcome. And we're so glad that you could join us today and invite you to help sustain and further our work by becoming an ASLI member, if you're not already part of the association. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you here. My name is Ryan Hediger, and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to be part of this event. Uh, I'm zooming in today from Hudson, Ohio, um, which is located on the ancestral and traditional homelands of the Wyandotte and the Haudenosaunee. Um, ASLI's leadership launched this new series last year to elevate the work of our members in creative writing, scholarship, public engagement, and more. Uh, we're excited to continue to foster connections with new public audiences through the spotlights. Um, logistically today, we ask you to remain on mute um, and we'll have time for questions later. Um, we'll ask you to use the chat to post your questions. You can do that as soon as they occur to you. Um, please try to keep the questions concise since we have you know, only a few minutes together today. Um, before we get to hear from the panelists, I'm excited to introduce my co-host in a bit more detail. Um, Suzanne Roberts is the author of Animal Bodies on Death, Desire, and Other Difficulties, Bad Tourist, Misadventures in Love and Travel, and Almost Somewhere, 28 Days on the John Muir Trail, as well as four books of poems. She holds a doctorate in literature and environment from the University of Nevada, Reno, and teaches in the low residency MFA program in creative writing at University of Nevada, Reno, Tahoe. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating with you, Ryan. Um, and I'm going to quickly tell everybody a little bit more about you. Um, Ryan Hediger is professor of English at Kent State University, focusing on US literature, the environmental humanities, and post humanism. He's the author of the 2019 book, Homesickness of Trauma and the Longing for Place in a Changing Environment, and editor of three essay collections, Animals and Agency, Animals and War, and the forthcoming collection, Planet Work, Rethinking Labor and Leisure in the Anthropocene. I'm also delighted to introduce our first panelist who will speak for five minutes and then we'll, um, we'll introduce the next uh, three panelists afterward. Um, I am delighted to introduce uh, Kaz Kazama Lee. Uh, his books include poetry, fiction, translation, and nonfiction. Most recently, he is the author of Northern Light, Power, Land, and the Memory of Water, founder of the small press Night, Book, Night Boat Books. He is a professor of literary arts and comparative literature and chair of the Department of Literature at the University of California, San Diego. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for coming um, and listening. Um, my book, Northern Light, Power Land and the Memory of Water was written uh, accidentally. I was not prepared for it. I wasn't trained for it. I wasn't qualified to write it. I had no business writing it. <laughs> um, I was musing about a strange little town that I grew up in, in Northern Manitoba, a town of seven streets um, and no permanent buildings. Um, it was a trailer park in the middle of the forest. That's where I grew up. And my childhood was something like Walnut Grove, you know, from a little house on the prairie. <laughs> Uh, I it dated myself with that reference, but those of you who are in my age range know exactly what I'm talking about. The rest of you have a vague idea of what that might be. Um, at any rate, um, I wanted to write about growing up um, in the far north, um, the, 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 the climates, the seasons, 
Um, I wanted to write about the sky because there was no street light lamps in this town. And so there was no light pollution per se in the dead of the night as, as we did, one could go out and look at the stars and um, see all manner of things. And that is where I learned how to read and where I learned how to write. So this was formative for me. Um, we were there because my father was an electrical engineer who was working on a hydroelectric dam project for Manitoba Hydro. And I've shown you a picture here is on the slide is a picture of the diversion channel between Lake Winnipeg and the Nelson River that Manitoba Hydro created in order to increase the flow and place a hydroelectric project there on treaty land. I didn't know this at the time of the Pimichikamek uh, First Nation. Treaty 5 land in Canada. So as I began to research my old hometown, um, I discovered that it was on treaty land and that this dam, and in the 40 years since we had lived there, um, had, uh, had an extremely negative impact on the local ecosystem and the food web, whatever you want to call the, the true, the true, what is the true term for the food chain? I don't know. Um, and that the traditional and, and, and cultural and economic livelihood of the local indigenous community. And so I contacted them and I wanted to gather information in order to, you know, incorporate that into my story. And what they did was uh, invite me to the community. And so I went and that is what this book is. It's the story of my own reckoning as an immigrant, trying to tell the story of being a brown immigrant to Canada, not realizing that on the other side of that national story, of course, lay the experience of the dispossessed indigenous people. And so, it came, to, it came to me then as I was working, as I, I had to literally train myself on the job, on the ground um, to be what? A journalist, an ethnographer, a scholar. I, I had to become a water scientist. Um, I had to learn about shore erosion. I mean, it was just, you know, kind of incredible, but it did come to me that as we tell our own stories and as we write about the natural world around us and the ecosystem around us, um, I think that the dialogue has come in, in forward in a certain way where we now start, start to think about in urban spaces and developed spaces as part of the ecosystem that we've divorced ourselves from that old school sense of what is the natural world. Um, but what we actually have to do is move the other way backwards from co colonization and start to talk about um, the history of Indigenous people on whatever land it is that we are also talking about, that that also becomes included. And so my own book, whatever it was that I thought I was going to write, it became subsumed and it disappeared. And this book um, emerged in its place. I will stop there. Thank you, Kasim, that, um, for that. I'm happy to introduce our next panelist. Um, Slaja uh, Blasian is a writer and lecturer at Bard College Berlin. Uh, her areas of research include speculative fiction, critical posthumanism, critical refugee studies, and migration. Uh, forthcoming is her book, Ghosts and Their Haunts, Spectrality in Early U.S. American Literature and Culture, and she'll talk for five minutes about her project. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, this one is not about haunts; it's ghosts and their hosts. <laughs> uh, but uh, the one that I will present today is. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you um, to the organizers for organizing this um, really um, important and interesting event. Uh, I've um, keep. Uh, um, discovering new titles. Uh, I'm, I'm currently read, reading Sue um, Ballard's um, book uh, on um, art and nature in the Anthropocene, and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm so happy to discover all of these titles here. So um, thank you for doing this work to everybody who's behind the scenes um, and for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Um, this is a um, collection of um, essays um, entitled Haunted Nature, and um, I will just say a few words about the origin of this project, which was um, quite simple. Um, basically, I kept encountering the concept of um, horror, or let's say sometimes Gothic, uh, in an increasing number of new publications and environmental humanities that seek to give expression to 
the current environmental challenges that we are facing. And um, so given that these challenges take pronounced the material forms, floods, storms, crop failures, water shortages, or simply the horsemen of the Anthropocene that dominate current news and media, I wanted to look into the capacity uh, of uh, horror to express this material degradation. Um, Sarah Crosby even proposed in her article Beyond Necrophilia that horror, I quote, is becoming the environmental norm, unquote. And um, it seemed to me that this proposal seems to resonate with many scholars uh, who um, keep um, referring to this um, um, idea. And as a scholar of horror and the Gothic, I began to think about the actual linkages of the aesthetics, ethics, vocabulary of horror from a literary and film studies perspective and ways in which it has been applied in the environmental context. Um, yeah. So, um, one other publication that has led me onto this path uh, as well was um, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh, uh, where he yet again writes that the extreme nature of today's climate events make them peculiarly resistant to contemporary modes of thinking and imagining. And um, there he specifically argues that it is only within the framework of what he calls generic outhouses that were once um, known by names such as the Gothic, the Romance, or the melodrama, and have now come to be called fantasy, horror, and science fiction that writers can find a narrative means to address environmental issues. He doesn't really explain how, um, so which I took this as a sign for myself to continue thinking where uh, Amitav Ghosh uh, left off. And um, um, I've also been thinking a lot about the uh, um, so-called unintelligibility of environmental challenges were told over and over again that given the, the planetary staging of the forces of the Anthropocene, they're seldom directly perceptible on a human scale. So as a consequence, uh, a lot of the theory seeking to express these issues in an academic framework will work with um, neologisms, um, hyper objects, um, heliotrope, I don't know, planetarity. Um, and instead of continuing on this path of inventing a new vocabulary or even new taxonomies, uh, um, I was interested in going back to an existing language that claims to have been grappling with a similar problem, namely this um, seeking to express the inexpressible, um, the um, not representable, um, which I believe is the language of spectrality. So. Um, and in a strange way, it was within this uh, spectral matters that um, one always finds this possibility of uh, um, communion in, in, in the inexpressibles. So this was something that um, was, um, yeah, it was also, um, the idea was also to, um, mm, to, to see if spectral matters have been in many ways filling exactly these representational gaps, uh, maybe even some two or three centuries earlier, because spectrality is all about trying to put into images something that was uh, unimaginable. Um, and because spectrality is just too broad of a topic, I narrowed my focus down to one specific area of interest, namely haunting, um, ways in which the past comes to determine the future and the present. Um, which seem particularly suitable in relation to um, current conceptualizations of nature, therefore haunted nature. It was also Gosh who suggested that to write climate change, the author must generate a setting that is not settled, but is entangled in multiple times and places. Um, the character must be a collective, narrative must pursue the unknown, etc. And, and it just seemed to me that haunting can come close to this um, premise. So uh, in a first step, I just made a list of scholars who I knew were working in what now would be called the eco-gothic to think about these questions with me. And we met for a conference and then continued our discussion in form of this um, publication. And uh, I think we came up with, um, um, uh, <laughs> I think, interesting collection of uh, um, material haunting sites, uh, such as microbes in the body, mold, uh, in homes, chthonic intelligence, planetary haunting, um, the current fascination with end of the world scenarios and 
all the way down to COVID-19 and um, our planet being haunted by uh, pandemics. Um, that's the um, last chapter. So yeah, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I am uh, pleased to introduce our next panelist. Uh, Char Miller is the W.M. Keck Professor of Environmental Analysis and History at Pomona, Pomona College. Mm -hmm. Westside Rising was awarded two book awards from the Texas State Historical Association. Forthcoming is Natural Consequences, Intimate Essays for a Planet in Peril from Chin Music Press in 2022. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you to my colleagues who are on here, to those who are working in the back shop, essentially, um, and to the many people who are on this call. I'm coming in from northeastern Pennsylvania, where I'm attending my 52nd high school reunion, since we couldn't have one for the last two years. Um, it's, broadly speaking, eastern Pequot, uh, but normally I am in Southern California on the um, ancestral and unceded lands of the Tongan people. Um, this project was something that I have been thinking about uh, because I lived in San Antonio starting in 1980 and teaching there since then. Um, and it emerged as um, Kazim said in, about his own experience in a place that I came to know and love, but was also very puzzled by. Um, and part of my puzzlement was trying to figure out flooding, which is not something one spends a lot of time thinking about, I suspect, unless you live in a city like San Antonio, uh, which like Austin and, and cities in between there is in what the National Weather Service calls Flash Flood Alley. Um, and so it's a place with these extraordinary floods that also reveal the slow violence, as Rob Nixon would call it, um, of the punishing impact of those floods on certain communities. And the 21 flood, as it turns out, which was devastating, massive, uh, one of the two largest that have ever hit this city, um, spawned a number of reactions, including building dams and, and sort of reshaping the river so that it, the San Antonio River, so that it drained more rapidly and flowed towards the Gulf more quickly. Um, what it didn't do was to do anything on, on behalf of those who actually died in this flood, whose neighborhoods were destroyed in this flood, um, and whose material lives were either ended on the one hand or, or so savagely uh, ripped to shreds um, that the West Side, as it's called in San Antonio, home to the impoverished people of the city, uh, black, white, and brown, uh, but mostly Latino at the time, um, found themselves not only bearing the burden of this um, devastating flood, and like all floods, it came and it went, but the damages remained uh, so much so that it wasn't until the 1970s when an environmental justice movement emerged in San Antonio um, that some of these uh, inequities, spatial inequities, were, were corrected. And so the book, um, not unlike uh, the subject of our um, workshop today of Nature and Memory, is about both the materialness of this process, um, but also of the way in which a city remembered or did not remember what had happened. Um, and for the 26 years I lived in San Antonio, I was very slowly picking my way through archives and giving talks locally and people would come up and say, yes, my family went through this process. And it was pretty clear at some level, and the book tries to make this um, explicit, that there were different kinds of ways in which people remembered what happened. Um, for those whose uh, downtown stores, for example, were flooded out, they had one set of memories, but they didn't remember that 80 or more people died. Uh, the city, in fact, said only 50 died, but I started going through the records and there was a lot more than that. So that's a different kind of not memoring, remembering. Um, but if you talk to people who lived on the west side of town, they absolutely knew what happened in 1921, but they had no political power. And so part of the book is about the way in which the flood exposed uh, the social inequities of a city that everybody there knew about, but this was a way to try to recover that memory. Um, it was a chance to recover a past that people I know who live there, who have lived there for six, seven generations said they all knew that downtown got flooded. None of them knew that the west side had flooded. Um, and so it was, it, I would say it was um, 
fortunate for me that I just started asking questions. I think it was um, incumbent upon me to not write from the inside of the West Side experience because it's not mine, um, but I could write through the lens of newspapers um, that reported of um, newspapers in the West Side that um, had disappeared over time. So there's another form of memory that simply got lost. And I recovered a document written by Spanish language newspapers within a week of the flood that was a very different story than one read in the Anglo dominated newspapers. Um, and so actually in addition to this book, there's a companion piece um, that redoes, re republishes a bilingual edition of that report um, as a way to sort of solidify the memories uh, of the time. And the final thing I would say about the book is that, that even as I was working on this, I was thinking about the questions of, of environmental justice or injustice, spatial inequities, um, and political disenfranchisement, to be sure. But a funny thing happened um, beginning in the 1970s in which the West Side seized political power. And so the last chapter and a half or two is really about that process, um, which in another text I could describe as the nature of hope, which is that after being disenfranchised and ignored and destroyed by flood after flood after flood, the West Side politicians and political leadership finally decided in a really interesting grassroots movement um, that they were gonna um, disrupt the local power elite and within 10 years had done so. It's a kind of an amazing story that's not much told about environmental justice movements. Usually we see the virtue, but rarely do we see the victory. Uh, in this case, they had a tremendous victory um, that has continued ever since. So, and the and the creeks that were once the source of many of this, these floodwaters have been transformed into uh, a series of linear parks so that where once one fled the water, now you start to gravitate back towards it, which means there's a different set of memories at play here. Um, and, you know, maybe with climate change and heavy rains like um, Hurricane Harvey that just devastated Houston, um, we may have another set of stories, but at the moment, it's been a story that tells a great deal about damage, death, and disarray, uh, but also says there's this silver lining that political power can be conf confronted, it can be disrupted, and it can lead to um, a more beneficial environment and thus a more beneficial life for many of those people whose grandparents uh, found themselves knee-deep in water if they were lucky. Thank you. Thanks, Char. That it's great to hear some hopeful elements well, of, of things going on. It took it took a half a century, but you know, I'll take my victories where I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm happy to introduce um, our fourth panelist, Sue Ballard, who is an associate professor of art history at Tehirona Waka, uh, Victoria University of Wellington, in Hauti Aurora, uh, New Zealand. Uh, she recently curated the exhibition. Listening Stones, Jumping Rocks um, at, at um, Te Pataka Te Adam uh, Art Gallery. Excuse my mispronunciations, Sue. Kia ora, Ryan. Thank you. Um, so, kia ora koto, namihi nui kia koto. Um, my name is Susan Ballard, and I'm coming to you here from Te Whanganui Atara, which is Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and I just greeted you and said hello. <laughs> um, so I'm also on a different time zone and part of what, I'm, I'm sure many of us are on different time zones, but I'm on one that's very different to yours. And part of what I was doing with my book was actually thinking about what that means to think across time zones, to think from the south to the north. Um, but part of that also means that I'm starting to wake up, it's five in the morning now. So I'm just gonna read a little bit, if you can forgive me, um, and use that as kind of a starting point for my discussion. So this is how my book starts. Once upon a time, <laughs> it's quite a good way to start a story. <laughs> Once upon a time, the planet was much cooler than it is today. Once upon a time, humans transformed the environment so much that it became necessary to say that we operated with a geological force. Once upon a time, we could talk about the weather, blue sky, and fresh air. Once upon a time, an artist filmed herself being buffeted by rising tides. Over 12 minutes and 11 seconds, 
The sun sets and the tide rises, softly at first and gradually with more urgency. She works to hold on to her land and stay safe. The light fades and she struggles to breathe. Her fingers grip at the edge of the platform, but there is very little to grasp. Once upon a time, another artist arrived on an island, seemingly inhabited only by birds. He began to paint them, giving them clothes, shoes, and fancy hats. Later, he returned to find the birds all stuffed. He found others splayed out in the kitchen of a well-meaning conservationist. He painted them again. This time, the painting hung like a shroud. So my book, Art and Nature in the Anthropocene, thinks about what it means for humans to be named geological, considers what it means for our geological impacts to be read in the rocks, water, and atmosphere of the planet, and wonders about the different ways that artworks like these can help us to understand and reflect on the planetary environment we've created. In this context, why write about contemporary art? Um, but I think that art has always had a role in describing our relationships with the planet. And as a discipline, art history describes carefully what it sees, connecting images to their social and cultural histories and ways of being in the world. So I think that art history helps us to observe. It helps us to think about all of these things at this very moment as they dematerialize before our eyes. And it does this by telling stories of looking. My question as an art historian is in an age of catastrophic change that remains just out of our grasp is, is this enough? If art history has a role to play, it is in describing and contextualizing the visual world as it appears right now. And to do this involves operating in a world of affects and sensations, bringing together contemporary artistic practices with histories that enable us to experience the present in a way that is attuned to many potential futures. And it's so interesting to sort of hear this relationship coming up in the presentation so far, past, present, future, always kind of be becoming entangled. So in Art and Nature in the Anthropocene, the artworks I talk about approach the planetary from these very situated and local experiences. They do not pretend to tell us how to think or act but instead document the transforming worlds of humans, nature, and the planet. And I think they tell a different story of the Anthropocene, one in which we might imagine a new planetary future. They perform and record complex histories and even more complex rememberings of planetary destruction and shaping through exhibition practices. They help us imagine the present of the Anthropocene as we have already lived it and as it is experienced. So in this book, I explore this world through the observation of visible things. I spend time with artworks that suggest new ways to approach the concept of nature as part of the transforming planetary environment. But to do this also means turning our attention to the gendered and racialized knowledge-making practices upon which the Anthropocene has been built. So it's in this context that my book develops across three central concerns. It thinks about how artists present new ways to understand planetary transformation. It examines how artists are thinking about humans and non-human being, living and extinction, witnessing and turning away. I talk about the environment, <laughs> about colonization, about capital and energy. But I also think about how art creatively contributes to rather than simply reflects our understanding of the world of non-art things, in particular this role of the human as a geological force. So I suggest that to think differently and notice all these bodies with which we share the planet, we need to think about these relationships as they're formed in these more than human multi-species spaces. And to do this means shifting our aesthetic relationships as well. My attention is on specific moments where artists construct new ways of seeing that challenge fixed concepts of nature and point to new ways of understanding the planet. And for me, this is what art history does. It looks at artworks again and proposes a new view. Thank you.
That was great. Um, thank you. And I wanted to remind um, everyone in the audience uh, to be, you know, asking some questions here because uh, we'd love to get to your questions. But in the meantime, um, I would I would love to start with the first question. Um, I'm super struck by this sort of idea of coming at the idea of nature and memory from all these different perspectives, from the art historian, from the historian, from the literary and film critic, from the poet, and uh, I think Kazem called himself sort of an accidental environmental memoirist. Um, and I was also struck by the idea of um, colonization that comes up in each of these stories. And um, I think Sue said something about recovering the past and Kazem said something about being an immigrant to a land, right, that was already taken from, you know, earlier and we all live on colonized land. So my question is, how do we break free from these colonial representations, these colonial memories to create sort of new memories of nature that are more inclusive and um, you've all touched on that, but I wonder if you have anything more to say because I, I'm, I'm interested in, in that subject. So anybody wanna start with that? Um, I, could, I could just say a couple of things. I mean, I think the major issue is um, how one, like what, what is the relationship of the world take away the adjective, the natural world, but just the world itself to the human experience. And in the colonizer's model of the world, if I could use that phrase, um, it a resource is meant to be exploited. And so the indigenous view of, of how water is to be used or how land is to be used or how stone is to be used um, is very different um, than a colonizer's model of the world, which is that stone is meant to be quarried to build things. Um, forests are meant to be cut down. Um, animals are meant to be eaten. Um, you know, it's not as if every indigenous culture is vegan. So, you know, they think animals are meant to be eaten too, but you get what I mean. So, um, and then there's a way that that was actually, um, you know, part of the colonial enterprise um, for, and I'll give you an example. Um, the ways that the land was used by the indigenous northern communities was very different. They were not, you know, you know, they were not cutting down every tree they could find to sell it to the south, um, or they were not, you know, they were not doing traditional agriculture where they were clearing land and farming. And so there was, in some way, that was part of the discourse was about use, about taking land that wasn't being used to its maximum potential, and 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 you could confiscate that. So if there's uranium in the, you know, or something in the ground that is required, um, that land was eminent, eminent domain away by the governments in, in, in legal ways. So all of this tangled legal de discourse became part of the colonial process. It wasn't as simple as an army coming in and conquering and taking people over. It was this sort of long, slow engagement um, through through the courts and through and through treaties, which you know were then abrogated, of course. So I think that you know we have to kind of expand the ways that we think about um, how all of this stuff happens, and it's absolutely one hundred percent exactly happening now. Um, you know, in the in, in in Brazil with you know with the the, the rainforest um, you know confiscation in Palestinian West Bank. Um, in Canada, in the northern part of Canada, in, and in the United States, um, with Standing Rock and other places, and in, in northern Finland, and in many, many places where Indigenous people are still engaged in, um, you know, trying to get sovereignty over their own, um, not, it's not territory, it's more like the closest thing you could come to it in English is the culinary term terroir, if you know what that is. It's like the land, everything in it, the water, all of the everything. It's not just resources to be exploited. It's this whole unified system. Um, I would, uh, I will only um, reformulate um, actually what um, Kazim um, just said, and um, um, I think Elizabeth Delory um, has a good um, answer to this uh, question in her book. Uh, um, where she cautions us that um, 
it is a problem that so many um, it's getting artworks, literature <laughs> claim um, the novelty um, of a crisis rather than being attentive to the historical continuity of dispossession and disaster um, caused by empire. Um, so um, I think um, to answer your question, any theories about um, the non-human or beyond the human will not be able to restructure the grounds uh, enough for change unless we reconsider the colonial and imperialist inheritance that envelops our current category of the human. Um, and um, in, in this moment in time, it is important to go back to the founding story um, as it seems like it's the foundation that is rotten. So you cannot build on that. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess in this I would go along with Sylvia Winter and plead for an unrelenting advocacy of a new humanist revolution to continue confronting um, the, 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 the problems of our humanism before we can do anything else. Um, I was going to add to your question because I, I think it's really interesting, but I, I also think that we've got to challenge the question in a little bit because um, the way that you framed it, Suzanne, was to break free from colonization, which I, I don't implies a kind of level of agency that um, is perhaps not possible. Um, and so I, I think one of the one of the things we have to be very careful about is um, locating colonization in the past. I, I think that colonization is very much in front of us and happening all over the world right now. And I, I think that the the intimate relationship between colonization and capital is just not, I mean, it's, you know, countries like Aotearoa, uh, it, that's, you know, why we, um, we were colonized. Um, so it's, um, something we've got to be very careful about in terms of locating ourselves in time as well as in place. Um, and I think that the second part of your question about creating new memories, um, I think some of that task is being done by actually looking at colonization itself um, and its impacts. So um, the work that I describe at the opening of my book is a work by um, an artist, Angela Tia Tia, and she's in Tuvalu when she's trying to resist the oncoming tide. And, you know, the work is very much about sea level rise. Um, and then the question of colonization becomes quite a different one if your um, entire country is disappearing underwater. Um, and when you've got a new level of migration and new levels of movement that are starting to have to happen. And, so I, I think it's a really important question, but I think it's one we also have to be quite careful with. Um, I'll go ahead and ask an, another question. And I want to remind, we've got some, some good questions already in the chat, but others, if, you, if you'd like to add a, a question there, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, the question that I, had shared with the panel um, does kind of follow on this question. I mean, the, the way I phrased it is how should we activate memories of nature? And it, you know, listening to our, to the conversations today, it really struck me how um, in every case, although in different ways, each, each of your talks emphasized ways that um, memories of, of nature or access to nature is variable. You know, Char mentioned, for example, the Spanish newspaper reports differing hugely from the from the English reports. So you talked about how art contributes to not just reflects uh, realities. And I just wondered if, if you had uh, observations about specific kinds of like techniques, maybe maybe that's not the right word, but strategies, like are, what, what are some ways to change the way we remember or the way that memories are made? Um, I wonder if folks have thoughts of, about that. I would one one of the um, one of the things that I think may respond to the, your good question about how do we activate memory, how do we or reactivate it in some way, uh, from an historian's point of view, um, um, 
and I spend a lot of time in archives, it, it isn't so much the questions that I ask before I go there, it's the ones that pop out when I suddenly open up something and go, holy shit, uh, that wasn't what I was thinking. Um, and in a way, in, in, in a verbal sense, what that essentially means is you listen, right? That you, you hear what, in this, in, in the example that you gave, that the Spanish language newspapers uh, and journalists were writing about, uh, there was this classic line in there that just sort of flipped my story in a way that I think I knew, but I hadn't seen quite so vividly. Which was, um, there was a paragraph in which they 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 talked about the sort of uh, white-owned businesses having lost material goods, and the West Side lost lives. And I went, Jesus, that's what the book is. I thought it might be something like that. But like Kazem said, you know, all of a sudden the book starts teaching you. And I hadn't even written the book yet, right? But, it, but, but that was sort of a, a moment in which I had to sort of stand back from what I had assumed to be true or sort of had sketched out in my head um, when it turns out that those on the ground had a different way of describing uh, what had occurred, and that you know fundamentally changed the way I wrote it. But it was also a way um, in in our sort of language now to sort of amplify voices that had been that had disappeared. I mean, there was one copy of this report that I know of that exists, um, and it somehow made its way into an archive. And I called up the archive, and they had just happened to digitize it. <laughs> So A, there's a God, and B, thank you very much because you just made my life infinitely easier. Um, but again, that there was one copy when it was a post-flood memento, which is also very weird um, in its own way, that I think, you know, I was very lucky. It was Felicity, uh, but sometimes you listen to Felicity. I really like that idea of listening to the archives. I, I think that's really, really fantastic. And uh, what it means is paying close attention. And I think that's what you're making an argument for is um, the way that we we do this. It's, it's like a methodology, isn't it? It's like to pay very, very close attention. And by doing that, we start to transform what we see, we transform what we hear. And in doing that, we transform what's known. And I, I think that that is kind of, you know, maybe maybe it's about a practice. It's a practice of how we research um, with these materials um, and kind of bringing them into the now as we do it. I want to just uh, add uh, something to this. I, uh, I also, I also, um, uh, really like um, the way you said um, to to listen um, um, because it opens up um, so many registers. How how do you listen and uh, how do you make the time to listen or how do you organize yourself to listen and um, and, and and there is so much uh, one could say about this. But uh, I'm thinking just uh, in terms of um, being an academic, which uh, most of us um, are, um, some of us institutionally ordained <laughs> to uh, to do this. Um, um, we also have a responsibility, and I'm just thinking, what is what is that responsibility? And I think to examine how we are coded in relation to nature and how we code in relation to nature and maybe, um, um, yeah, envelop this um, to make space for uh, different images. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just continue thinking where, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's good to start with listening. In my case, going into the community as a person who was complicit, who was part of the story itself, right? Because my, my father's role in building the dam and my position, a privileged position of, of coming back into the community after many years, um, I had to, um, you know, approach these conversations and some of them really were formal interviews. Uh, a lot of them, others were conversations. I mean, I went to the grocery store um, the North Mart uh, in the middle of Cross Lake, Manitoba, which is, you know, where a lot of the elders go and hang out during the day it, because, the, you know, there's, you know, in terms of social spaces. And I would just sit there 
and, and find people to talk to or go out and hang out at, at the picnic tables in front of the band hall and wait for people to come by. And, you know, it's a small community. Everyone knows a stranger. Word got around. Some, some people came to find me, to talk to me, you know. And so I had to really think about First of all, think about narrative memory and how it functions differently um, in such cultures. And then I also had to really study up on and read a lot of the scholars from New Zealand who have written about decolonial methodologies in terms of working with indigenous communities. And um, those were incredibly, you know, important, you know, preparatory work as um, I was not able to just go in and make this a personal memoir, in other words. You know, as a creative writer, that's what my background is. That's how I come to all of this, not as a scholar. Um, you know, we don't, we don't learn anything other than tell your story. We don't learn about the ethics of, um, of telling the stories of other people, first of all, uh, as Char mentioned, but also the ethics of how those stories get told and the ethics of how the scholar, the outside scholar who's going into a community behaves. And there, there was not, a, the book was not the end. Um, and so my engagement at the community, um, you know, ne necessarily continued and continues to this day. In fact, just yesterday, I, you know, I gave, I sent a box of books, of uh, 50 books or so to the high school for them to use in their classes. And just yesterday, I did a Zoom with one of the classes that had read the book and we talked about it. You know, these are high school students from that community themselves. Hey, get this. They told me, we learned so much about what happened from your book. And I said, okay, well, the fact that you're learning about it from my book, that's part, of, that's a problem that we have to talk about, <laughs> you know? So, you know, that's how it goes. I love that story, Kazam, about the high school students learning from your book. Um, <laughs> And you touched on this a little bit, this sort of idea of narrative memory and how, how we write about memory. And I'm just wondering um, if anybody else has anything to add about the way in which your research or your writing has sort of changed your own memories of nature or, or the way you think about memory and nature, like specifically. And then we do have a couple of specific questions for um, Slaja, which we'll, we'll get to uh, after we hear from everybody again. Say it again, Suzanne. How has the writing the book changed our own conceptions yeah. of me with you? Yeah. yeah. So, like, you know, how has writing writing the book or your other writing or your research about um, this particular project, how has that sort of informed your own memories or changed your own memories? Because I know um, I'm a memoirist and I know that as I write, I actually realize that my memories change right? Because I'm yeah, working through it. And so I'm wondering, at, you know, yeah. as both academic scholars with your research, but also as creative writers, how do your own memories of the landscape of nature, um, of your place in the world, how, how did that change through, through the writing? Yeah, well, in my case, it was a restoration of memory because the child who was there had certain memories of, you know, playing in the woods and how much fun it was to go look at the stars. You know, I saw Jupiter through a telescope and, you know, whatever it was. And then the, the, the memories that, that couldn't have been there for the child, which were what, 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 what the dam was doing, what was happening in Cross Lake at the same time that I was there. And so it was almost like a restoration project. Uh, you know, when you think about it at the beginning of these type of events, we all did it when we do this the little bit of the land acknowledgement. So my book is like, a, you know, a 180 page long land acknowledgement. It's sort of like, this is where I actually came from. This is where I was all this time. And so one of the assignments that I use for my students, both in the creative writing classes and in, in the literature classes, is to say, you know, find out where you are from. Find out what, what whose land was that? What happened to those people? Where are they now? What are the issues that are facing the community? So I give them like this little, just a report, do like a little five page report and fit and figure. And it's just incredible what people come back with because all of that information is findable. It's not that history didn't vanish. It's just sitting out there in plain sight. 
Um, I uh, I would like to. Uh, I'm I'm not really sure because I think um, it's okay. So uh, it's it's maybe opposed to what you just uh, said, Kazim. Um, um, Okay, so uh, um, to to remember how I remembered nature before I worked on nature and memory, <laughs> that's hard. Um, but uh, if thinking about my family, I, uh, I come from a very rural family, um, but I always lived in a city. So my family always has um, 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 always went considered going home to. Uh, to, to go to a rural natural environment uh, for life. And uh, to, so as if you didn't have a life unless you go back to where you are from uh, and then for the rest of the time you don't have a life. So um, at the same time being extremely estranged from this very same place where you are is also a very strange thing. So the urban environment that we lived in was always perceived as something artificial and the way to be oneself, it was necessary to be surrounded by nature, by non-human sentience. And, um, and this is a feeling that I think I now um, question or challenge uh, after having done um, the work that I have done um, by um, seeing nature everywhere. And um, I would even say that I consider it my responsibility to contribute to the idea of a permeability of human bodies with uh, non-human materialities in spite of our inherited ideas about nature. So, I mean, I guess, I guess both can exist at the same time. One of the things that happened for me when writing this book was um, an ability to see um, artworks that I had previously dismissed as being quite boring, like landscape paintings. <laughs> um, I've always been a contemporary art historian. You know, my, my field has been in new media and video installation. Um, and then I suddenly found myself obsessing over these landscape paintings. And, you know, especially, you know, and suddenly as I start to realize more about the history of the planet and, you know, looking at, Dutch paintings of iced over cities and realizing that what I was looking at was evidence of the little ice age and kind of the, the, the memory, if that's what we want to call it, contained within those images transformed for me through the research. So I was kind of suddenly looking at something as if it was like right there in the present in front of me. And that was kind of quite a transformation for me. Um, I, as an art historian, I should have already done that, but it was kind of a, a change that happened. Yeah. So, and I, I think that that um, that we only see nature in those rural environments is also um, a really important kind of um, challenge. I, I think that that you know, once we start to look again, we start to look again at all sorts of environments. Um, you know, the floods that you're talking about. Um, only happen because there's a relationship between a city and a river, right? You don't have one without the other. They're kind of two together. So, yeah. Yeah, and I would say one of the, and I love the notion of Cousins about restoration of memory. Um, and this book, like others I've done, and the one that's about to come out, um, in part, I restore that memory. And I, I say that um, carefully, I hope, um, mostly by walking. Um, and in this case, walking up and down tributaries uh, that I didn't even know were there. I mean, I think some of it is rediscovering that we physically are in nature. And as, as, as Sue said, you know, a river in a city, like that's like embedded. Um, but as anyone who lives in Los Angeles or ever visited it, um, might laugh at the fact that the LA River is in fact a river. Um, and so, but if you walk it, literally walk in it, you can't miss that it's a river. The fish have figured it out, the birds have figured it out. And so I take my students down there every year as a kind of baptismal in a sense to say, look, your feet are gonna get wet, your mom's not gonna be happy, but I want you to get your feet wet walking under the Interstate 5 so that you understand like this archeological space. Um, and it's a way to recover if only through 
through imagination the, the fact of a river. Um, and certainly that was part of what I was trying to do when West Side Rising is, is at once to recognize a river that functioned in certain ways. And in some of the times it killed people, um, but also as a message to those who lived in the 21st century for whom it's never flooded like that before, which is to say, um, the system is a system. Um, and you better, and we have to respect that as a, a, a fact to be sure, but also something that uh, previous generations had forgotten. And one of the threads running through the book is how many floods there were that nobody ever remembered um, and to their peril, right? That there was one in 1819 and by 1840, no one was talking about that flood because there was one in 1830 and that's the one they remembered, but it was a small flood. The one in 1819 was massive. Um, and so some of this is um, um, what I, I mean, it's a different form of climate denial. And the denial is that I don't live in a particular place because I have a car and it's concretized. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that I move through in particular ways. Um, but you, you do that at some cost, whether, whether it's, in, you know, in, in Brisbane or elsewhere, where periodically floods come in at extraordinary rates and, um, or wildfires in Sydney or in, in Southern California or any med, med eco zone. Um, if you build in fire zones, you're going to burn. But we have a politics that says, don't worry. If you build in a floodplain, you're going to flood but we have a politics that says, don't worry. Um, and some of, some of what I want to do is to make people worry. It, it strikes me, Char, that like th these are ways of listening too, like listening mm -hmm. to fire, listening mm -hmm. to fish, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. to expand on that, that, yeah. that point. Um, we, ha mm -hmm. we have a, a number of interesting questions in the chat and we want to at least get to some of them. One, one, one question is, is directed uh, to you, Char, it's, uh, I think it's from Enkiro Doris. I hope I got your name right. Um, to Char, I, the question is, I would like to know more on how the Latino environmental justice movement has contributed uh, to rebuild lives in San Antonio. Oh, what a great question. I have a whole chapter for you to read. Uh, two of them, actually. Um, there, there are a couple of ways to think about it, one of which is just the way in which uh, the Latino movement, it was called COPS, Communities Organized for Public Services, how it organized uh, in a city that had paid absolutely no attention to their neighborhoods and those neighborhoods' needs, both environmental, social, political, uh, public health, and the like, um, was to pick up on one of the terms, um, is literally to listen to whoever um, Ernie Cortez is sort of the driving force of this, who had grown up in the West Side, um, and he just started talking to every union leader, to every parish hall, um, listening, 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 and saying, what are the key issues? Um, and in the process, it turns out, not surprisingly, it was mostly women to whom he listened, with whom he spoke and who told him exactly what were the issues that, that the community was facing. And um, out of that came another flood in 1974, and that's when they struck. Because they'd been thinking, listening for two years, they had figured out They'd gone through the city's budgets. I mean, they, the, the extraordinary work that they had done under the radar then came out in another flood in which they basically accused the city of slow violence, uh, perpetuated by one power elite against another uh, disenfranchised people, um, and literally shocked the, the leadership into action in a way that I've never seen anywhere else. Um, and for a community that received no benefits whatsoever within 10 years, it had more than a half a billion dollars pouring into its neighborhoods to build streets, schools, housing, uh, sewers. There were no sewers. There was no water. Um, I mean, it's a kind of a flip on a story I've never seen, uh, at least in the United States before. Um, and that has continued. And, you know, it, COPS is no longer the powerhouse that it once was, but there are other movements that have emerged as a process of this. And um, for many of them, they did not know that the 1921 flood was sort of a, a genealogical origin story for much of the work that was done in the 1970s. Um, and so it's, it's been, um, but it is now. And I think that's part of the, what Cousin said is about sort of restoration of memory. And it's not my memories to be sure, but it helps build the political power base that now has, has it as part of its arsenal. 
um, for its own future storytelling. So thank you for the question. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So we are just a little bit over time. Um, we understand if people have to go, but we do have one last question from the chat and it's directed to Slaja that we wanted to sort of end with. Um, this question brought me back to my uh, graduate school days. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I have I wrote a dissertation on the eco-gothic. Um, Richard Watts wonders if theories of the sublime, especially as developed in the 18th and 19th centuries, aren't also reaching toward a form of haunted nature. Might we revisit the sublime as another prescient articulation of a type of eco horror? And then there was another question that piggybacked off of that one um, that asked, is there a wider range of effective charge beyond horror? which haunted nature has the capacity to provoke? So a two-part question. Um, Slaja, do you mind answering that before we say goodbye? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a really, really um, short uh, answer since we're over time. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, uh, so many, and I'm just going to um, say one, which is um, intimacy. Um, uh, uh, haunting confirms the context of intimacy. Um, it, uh, it's uh, the original um, application of the word haunting goes back to a 13th century Middle English uh, verb ha ha haunten, um, which um, is a habit or a recurring practice, um, going back to, uh, insistently going back to. Um, so um, this, uh, the so so intimacy uh, would be the 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 most um, important effect in this context. I would even even say to frequent to resort to to be familiar with all of this uh, are um, definitions um, of haunting um, that um, get lost in, uh, in mainstream um, horror cinema, uh, but uh, are all over the place uh, in other niches. So yeah. Um, that's, um, I, uh, I thought, uh, Char, you had such a good, uh, last sentence. This is not such a great last sentence. Uh, you said, uh, we want to, we want to provoke. What did you say? We want to, uh, we want to cause trouble. <laughs> I have no idea what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to um, how to like give a round uh, last uh, sentence um, answer to this question because it's so packed. There is so much uh, to be said about it, but I'm also very conscious of the time. Now. We want to make them worry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We want to make them worry. Let's end with that. <laughs> that's, that's excellent.